Before I begin, I need to recall my comrades, elders, and ancestors into this space, making it holy and making it a temporary home. Too often I'm asked to show up to be black in February and queer in June, and I always show up both in both, and so tonight will be no exception. Um, I want to acknowledge all of the people around the world who are in the midst of war, whether that be the Ukrainians or Europeans or our families in Texas and in Florida. There's many wars raging on many fronts and we are holding them all. I also know and want to name black GLBT freedom fighters, such as Marsha P. Johnson, Rutherford Baynard, and James Baldwin, just to name a few. When I offer this sermon, I want to be clear that I honor all of those who we have lost in the AIDS crisis, to the prison industrial complex, to toxic masculinity, religious conversion and other hate crimes. Black queer lives are precious and beautiful. I am standing in their legacy as a out proud black queer woman. I want to offer a small trigger warning I will use words that describe or invoke sexual or domestic violence, and I will say the phrase, thoughts of harm. Please adjust as needed to support your spirit. Let us begin our journey. My descent into queerness started early, right around kindergarten. I always knew I was strange. I always knew that I was out of sync with the world. I was marching to every drum. The first time I identified as something, I claimed to be a Christmas tree. Later, um, after a name calling incident in the schoolyard, I was informed that I was black. This was new to me. Given our short time together, I won't delve hard into racial identity development theory, but will say that my connotations of black and blackness were not positive. Hence, I didn't want to be black. In retrospect, I was experiencing concurrent identity development related to race, gender, and sexual orientation. I do think this is common for queer, black, indigenous, and people of color, which I may to refer to as BIPOC as we journey further into the story. Um, I think these layered developments resulted in the creation of my complex, beautiful self. The first time I felt a connection to something other than family was Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock. That strange little village of underground gnomes with their dozer and their madam trash heap were speaking my language. I was so, saw so much of myself in those little Muppets. My two main and favorite characters were Red Fraggle and Uncle Traveling Matt. Red was fierce and brave. She was full of energy and ideas and she never let her friends down. Uncle Traveling Matt, he left home to explore the world, but used postcards to communicate, to educate and stay connected. I wanted to be both, somebody who embraced their whole family and somebody who left home and explored the world. Although I lacked the language, I sensed that Red Fraggle was the exact opposite of the women in my community. of the women in my community, a contrast of femme. I was drawn to that, you know, this has been a strange night. My computer's trying to die on me, there we go. Although I lacked the language, I sensed that Red Fraggle was the exact opposite of the women in my life, a contrast to femme. I was drawn to that contrast and to her otherness. There are other signs of my budding lesbian identity. I was in love with 1980s glam rocker cover albums. I'm talking Hall & Oates 1971. They presented themselves on this gender arch and I felt a strange kinship. You can Google that album cover if you want. There are stories that I will never live down like my love of Richard Simmons and the 1980s music variety show, Solid Gold. Marilyn McCoo was definitely one of my first crushes. I can tell you about the first time I heard Tracy Chapman's Fast Car. I was, I'm sure it was on the radio, but when I saw her on TV, I was surprised. See, she was small in stature, soft spoken, spoken, but her voice to me, to my spirit was a thunderclap in July. 
Her whole existence resonated with my core. I had surmised from my 14-year-old wisdom that everyone called Tracy a lesbian, that liking her music then made you a lesbian. It's important to note that I didn't associate lesbianism with sexual orientation, but instead viewed it as a way of being counter or a way to be other. But in the confusion, I found a word to describe what I was experiencing. I found a shape to hold my otherness. I also knew from cultural and community context clues, everyone whispered and mocked lesbians, that feeling like a lesbian was private that expressing it like Cousin Terry or Tracy Chapman was not okay. So I kept my new language and my new world to myself. In high school, I had a chance to explore the library. I used the banned book list to find books with lesbian themes. I landed on Rita Mae Brown's Ruby Fruit Jungle, which lived in my backpack for the most extended checkout period possible, but I knew I still needed to read it to be private and be in. So I made sure to erase my name off the little checkout card in the back. In my junior year, I was well aware that a lesbian was a sexual orientation. I had my first girl crush on Aaron Kay. We were friends, we hung out and chatted on the phone. And when I shared my crush, she responded with a cute little kiss on my cheek and let me know that it was not reciprocated. Such a fitting end to that phase of my life. In the fall of 1991, um, I started, oh, in the fall of 1995, I attended St. Mary's University, a small Catholic liberal school in Southern Minnesota. I, in closed circles, I shared that I was a lesbian, which had morphed into bisexuality, but by no means was I public. There was a small community of queer kids who found each other on sports teams or theater programs or at the local bars. I had friendships in all of those subgroups and by my senior year, we rallied and formed a small but mighty gay student alliance. You guessed it, at the Catholic school. In 1998, I came out to the whole damn city of Minneapolis. I sent a letter to the local GLBT. Did I mention it's 1998? We didn't have all the letters yet. Um, to the local magazine called Lavender. I asked for the letter to be printed anonymously, but it wasn't. There in big, bold print was my unique name, Kiana Denae Perkins wants to know where all the lesbians are hanging out. <laughs> what followed within a day of Lavender hitting the newsstand was some strange family phone tree of gossip. My mom was elected um, to be the Speaker of the House and Central Dispatch of All Information. I can still hear her voice. Um, I heard you're a lesbian. And honesty was my only option. I confessed. Yes, I am. Her response to my surprise and joy was acceptance. My mother shared that she loved me and that nothing would be changing. Within a week, we had a big family dinner with all of my sisters and nibblings. We have pictures from that event that we call the Kiana Dene coming out party. At this point in the story, I want to be clear about two things. First, I know that my ability to come out and be accepted by my family is a privilege. A, I am privileged to have a family that loves me, period, no caveats. I try not to take that for granted, and I try to use the privilege for good, sharing my story in the hopes of helping someone else, some other family. The reason, this is one of the reasons why I chose Julianne's The Mermaid as the story for all ages. This is a life-giving, there is life-giving power in having affirming adults in the life of queer and gender non-binary and trans youth. Abuela sees Julian affirms when he shares that he might be a mermaid too. She even takes him to the mermaid parade. How beautiful, echoing so much of what I have experienced in my coming out process, what I wished everybody experienced. But the second thing I wanna make sure to tell you is that I'm leaving out all the times a family member rejected me when I was not invited, not allowed to bring, told not to talk about, the times where I was tolerated out of familiar obligation. I cannot casually revisit those moments for a sermon. 
I honor that they are a part of my story, but not the part I'm telling today. So where am I now? 20 years goes by so fast. I think I have lived five years in two. Thank you, COVID. I have come out so many times in so many ways, covering so many topics. My otherness runs deep. I am an out, unapologetic, black, queer woman. I am out as a survivor of physical, sexual, and domestic violence. I am out as a person with mental health realities that include depression. I'm not a traditional mom. I am an advocate for black trans lives. I am an abolitionist. I am the member of many dynamic, rich, textured communities. I am a black Unitarian Universalist. And to be clear, I am a black person who is a Unitarian Universalist and I am also a member of the beloved blue faith community. There is much Venn diagram overlap, but they are not the same and not interchangeable terms. Context matters, friends. I also want to name that there is layers of othering and marginalization that come with being a member of and seeking ordination in the predominantly but not all white denomination. But that is a whole other sermon. Just know that I am living my best life and I am thriving in the intersection of my marginalized identities. As I prepare to go, I want to offer these four themes of learning that have helped me and I hope that they can help you too. The first is the role of language. I came out as a lesbian, then bisexual, and then queer. I have currently settled, just for today, on the micro labels of queer and pansexual. If these words existed in the early 1980s, I had no access to them. Their prevalence and normalization have happened over these last 20 years. The result of this expansion of language means I get to increase my self-awareness and fully share who I am to others. There is profound beauty in my identity, becoming more nuanced and simultaneously very qualified. Lesson number two, the role of honesty. The way I have come to understand and practice honesty matches my maturity. At 14, it was simple honesty with myself that I was sexually attracted to women. At 40 plus years old, it looks like being honest with myself and intimate partners about consent and boundaries. Honesty with self was a critical factor in all of my growth. We, the royal usage, are taught to override our feelings. Our inner voice is silenced in multiple ways. We have to unlearn this, to build new narratives and embrace honesty. It is how we move to the next best version of ourselves. Lesson number three, the role of community. And by an I say community, I mean your family, your pod, birth, chosen, cluster of care, the people who got your back. Just like I found correlations between honesty and maturity, I also see a correlation between my access to community support and my thriving. Times when I have felt and acted alone, I struggled. Those are the times when I was prone to ideas of self-harm and general destruction. I was moving at the speed of self and community harm. The times when I'd centered community as a member in need and a contributing member, I found myself inundated by so much love and care. The times I have moved at the speed of trust and relationship have literally changed me at my core. At my core. I cannot say this enough. Find your people people who see your beauty and your brilliance and are determined to make sure you see it too. People who refuse to let you dull your shine. Lesson four, the importance of representation. I know I'm saying this young man's name wrong from the book. I just can't find it right now, the correct pronunciation. Another reason I chose Julian's story was the representation of black and brown families and queer identity. There is a persistent stereotype that all people of color are homophobic. This book changes that stale, false narrative and replaces it 
with a multi-generational, culturally rich fairy tale about gender presentation and play. I think people forget that not all black, indigenous, and people of color families are homophobic because here's the here's the here's the punchline, because some black, indigenous, and people of color are queer. BIPOCs are not a monolith. Queerness is not a monolith. Not all cultures are being expressed or experienced from a colonized lens. I could go on. I'll stop. I just need you to trust that representation matters. Stay with me, friends. We're coming around the river bend. How do we move forward? Our world shifted on March 13th, 2020, when COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. And we are now looking at our third March of COVID. That coupled with the death of George Floyd and so many other black and brown bodies after George, a tumultuous election cycle, climate crisis escalation, glaring disparities in healthcare, education and resource access. And tonight, all of our eyes are on Ukraine and Russia. Friends, let's take a breath. This is a lot. We are holding a great deal of collective trauma and grief. And although we may not have personal, although we may have personal plans, we don't have a collective healing plan. I feel this in my heart daily. I don't think we are ready for the hurricane of, P, of post traumatic stress disorder and grief that is sitting on the edge of our lives. I think the only way we come out of this moment better is if we intentionally work to reconnect reimagine and realign with all of our shared humanity. We are not just black. We are not just queer. We are not just Ukrainian. We are not just soldiers. We are not just people who are willing down, willing to lie down. We are whole. We are complex people who come to the table of survival whole. We want to be accepted whole to do the work of healing from a place of wholeness. We are many truths that exist in the frame of community. Hence the work of survival must be done with our whole selves in that same community frame. My reemergence plan includes dedicating time to healing and the offer of grace to self and others. We are in uncharted space and we will need both grace, compassion, each other, all. We cannot be free until we are all free. We all have something to give. Ask, how can you be of service in your community on a local, regional, and national level? There is not a lack of work, and we also honor the need to rest because it is a form of ministry and care. So friends, family, elders, comrades, my closing words are simply this. Do not postpone joy. Don't let joy pass you by. When you think, wherever you think joy might be, go there. Set up home and make room for new neighbors. Don't let anything hold you back from what you know to be good and true. A song that we're going to hear in a little bit or right after I'm done is this joy by the Resistance Revival Choir. I want all of us to leave this holy place knowing that this joy and light is mine and this joy and light in, is yours. That joy is resistance and that we are resisting with our whole hearts coming back full circle in to love. Ashe and amen, my friends. <laughs> 